Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the European Politics in Transition series. Uh, since it's eight o'clock sharp, we'll wait another two or three minutes before everyone has joined our live broadcast. And after that, we'll just begin our talk about uh, the populist radical right and the pandemic. Welcome everyone to the second episode of the European Politics in Transition series, a series on the transformation of party politics in Europe, um, organized by the Amsterdam Center for European Studies together with SPI 25. Uh, today we'll be discussing the populist radical right and how the pandemic has affected populist radical right parties across Europe. We'll be doing this with four experts in the field. Um, first of all, Katarina Froyo, who is an assistant professor in political science at the Center for European Studies and Comparative Politics at Sciences Po in Paris. Uh, she has published extensively on the far right and the internet and has also written quite uh, a bit about the far right in Italy, most not notably about the um, uh, social movements uh, there. Um, our second speaker will be Daphne Halikiopoulou, um, Professor of Comparative Politics at the University of Reading. She has uh, published extensively on nationalism and on the factors that determine support for populist radical right parties. And her recent book is focused on the Golden Dawn in Greece and is entitled Golden Dawn's Nationalist Solution, Explaining the Rise of the Far Right in Greece. Our third speaker today is Leonie de Jonge, uh, assistant professor in the Department of Political Science uh, or the uh, Department of European Politics and Society at the University of Groningen. And she focuses on the populist radical right and its relationship to the media. And she's an expert on the Benelux countries. And lastly, we are joined today by Matthijs Rodan, Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Amsterdam, um, who, is a, who has published extensively about populism as an ideology and is founder of The Populist, a study of populist parties across Europe that is frequently cited in the media. So the setup for today will be that we'll start with a round of introductory statements in which our four experts will uh, describe how they see the relationship between the pandemic and the populist radical right. Uh, after that, we'll have a joint discussion with the four experts focusing on various aspects of the populist radical rights and its relation to the pandemic, such as how uh, the pandemic relates to the ideology of populist radical right parties, how it affects their electoral success, but also, for example, how it affects their cooperation um, internationally and how it affects the relationship between the populist radical right and the far right. Um, 
Um, and after that, we'll be taking questions from you, the audience, through the Q and A uh, chat that we have available for you. So, if you're watching from home and you would like to ask a question to one of our experts, feel free to write down your question in the Q and A box. Um, and if you're joining us through YouTube, you can also leave your question there, and we'll try to integrate it in our discussion and provide you with a satisfying answer to your question. Now, to start with. Uh, we'll make a round of uh, uh, our experts and see whether they agree or disagree with a statement that has been made quite frequent by commentators, which is that the pandemic really is the end of the populist radical right. The populist radical right parties have been quite successful in the past decades but that the pandemic is reshaping politics to such an extent that we can expect that it will negatively affect the success of populist radical right parties and that we will see that they will slowly start to dwindle. Um, first of all, I would like to go to Katarina Froyo from Sean's Paul Paris. Hi, Hi Katarina, welcome to our live session. Um, what is your impression as an expert? How is the pandemic affecting populist radical right parties? Hi Zara, thanks a lot for having me here. It's a pleasure to join you all for this uh, intriguing discussion. So it's a very difficult question, and but I tend to disagree with, um, let's say, statements that are too quick in saying that the pandemic uh, will not actually profit the radical right, because I think we have to distinguish between short and long term uh, effects. In the short run, and I'm sure we will discuss this further later, I don't see how these parties can profit of the pandemic, because my impression is that the pandemic brought them somehow out from their comfort zone. It obliged these parties to speak and address issues like health and public health that are not necessarily their own issues, right? The issues over which they feel more comfortable on campaigning, such as uh, immigration, integration, or also more recently European integration. At the same time, I think it is very difficult to forecast the consequences of the pandemic in economic terms and in social terms, in terms of social and economic inequalities. Then uh, the question is, to what extent then these parties will be able to exploit these consequences in their own advantage, as they did, for example, already in the aftermath of the Great Recession. Um, my, my impression is that there, is, uh, there are many similarities with the Great Recession, because in the short run, even then, we didn't see um, that, um, that shock profited the radical right. But on the long run, the scenario was pretty different. I stop here for the moment. So your assessment is that the long, uh, wrong, short-term consequences um, might be that it doesn't offer an opportunity for the populist radical right, but that in the long term it remains to be seen whether it has a positive or a negative effect. Um, you're currently working in France. And I presume you're also following uh, the main French populist radical right party, the Front National. Um, could you say a little bit uh, how that party has responded to the crisis? Has it been very critical of the government approach to the corona crisis? Um... Yes. I live and work in France and they follow French politics from very close, obviously for what they do. And, um, and they also follow from close the politics of Italy and especially the radical right in Italy. And both France and Italy, both the Rassemblement National, former Front National, and the League and Brothers of Italy have been actually three cases of special interest in the sense that differently from what we have heard from Bolsonaro or also Trump, uh, they did not minimize at all the pandemic since the beginning. Quite the contrary, the pandemic kept them busy since the first day, the free parties. Um, other commonalities between these three parties that we will see, they diverge a lot in terms of frames and you know answers and uh, responses to 
to uh, government's policies was the fact that they have very blurred stances when it comes to assess um, the lockdown measures in particular that have been implemented both by the French and Italian government. Just for our speakers who are not familiar perhaps with Italian and French politics, uh, France and Italy have undergone what can be called severe me measures of lockdown in the sense that starting from March until June, you couldn't uh, go out from your home without an authorized reason. And there were very few cases that were actually authorized. And in any case, you basically were obliged to carry a handwritten de uh, declaration where you would specify the purpose of, of, for living home. And there were only three, uh, let's say, things you were allowed to do at that time. Uh, either you were going or traveling from work if you were doing an essential job, either you would go to essential stores, supermarkets and pharmacies, or you had to go uh, to hospitals. So, and actually, interestingly enough, the Rassemblement National, like the League and Brothers of Italy, uh, in the beginning, they were extremely critical of the lockdown. They opposed these measures and they denounced, uh, actually Marine Le Pen, she said that the lockdown is the last measure that needs to be taken when everything else is lost. But at the same time, um, after the first months of the pandemic, they started somehow um, not campaigning anymore against uh, the lockdown, but starting to reframe their opposition in terms of um, actually uh, necessity. So if a severe and strict lockdown is needed, then uh, we should have it. So I would say that depending on the period of the pandemic that you consider, whether you are you know, uh, closer to the beginning, in both France and Italy, it was late January, uh, beginning of February, or at the end, you will see that the positions of these parties on the policies of the respective governments were pretty blurred, very blatant uh, at the beginning against the lockdown and uh, progressively adapting as soon as far as also these measures become progressively more popular among uh, their respective voters. Okay, in that case, we already uh, notice an interesting difference here between uh, the French and Italian populist radical right parties and the ones in the Netherlands, uh, who were first the first parties to call for a lockdown and then subsequently actually changed their agenda as an opposed to lockdown. Um, let's move to Daphne Halikiopoulou of the University of Reading. Good evening, Daphne. Hello there. Good evening from Reading. Hi, welcome. So do you agree with Katerina that it's too early to predict what the long term consequences of the pandemic will be for the populist radical rights? Yes, I do. So I, I was going to start this to very briefly say the question to the answer to your question would be that I, I do think that the, the death of the radical right has been indeed exaggerated. Um, but I want to develop on that by making three points. And so, and agree with Katerina in actually quite a lot of, of what she says, I think the gist is the same. So I think as a first point, and that's an obvious point, is that I think the pandemic has created both constraints and opportunities for the populist radical right. So in terms of the constraints, they go back to your point about the ideology, uh, and that is the sort of anti-expertise point, right? So by definition, populists are against elites and they're against, or at least they say they are, against elites and against uh, expertise. But the pandemic has highlighted the importance of this. Um, and people really, um, at, least in, at least in the beginning, were really seeking out competence. They were seeking out experience in government. They were seeking out experience with policy. And um, all that goes down to, to competence and expertise. And that's what populists don't have. So in that sense, uh, the pandemic has posed a significant constraint on uh, the, the populist radical right parties. At the same time, though, they, they offer an it offers an opportunity to them. And I think that's a, 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 a twofold opportunity. On the one hand, they have been known to capitalize on various crises before, whether this crisis is, uh, you know, an, an economic crisis or a broader societal crisis. They always capitalize on that. And the second is that these parties also, um, it does give them an opportunity again to basically try to curtail democracy and strengthen their powers. So my second point really is that in order to assess the impact of the pandemic to, um, on 
on populist radical right parties, actors, etc. We need to distinguish between those um, who are in power and those who are in opposition. So I think that um, those who are in opposition, especially those that are small niche or fringe parties, they will suffer in the short term um, because they are unable to offer this competence and, and expertise that voters want in the short run. And this is where I agree with Katerina. Um, However, those in power, and here maybe we, we're talking about, you know, for example, some, some uh, countries in Eastern Europe, um, those in power will be able to instrumentalize a state of emergency and, and try to derail democracy by, by consolidating more power. So for them, um, it's actually an opportunity. But I do think that this also raises a question that, that we may pick up on discussion later which is who are we talking about and what is really populism right what is really are we talking about um some of these fringe parties are we talking about um authoritarians in power um is it too broad an umbrella term to give us an analytical answer in the first place so i think that that comes to play um but so as a, as a third point to move on from that what about the opportunities themselves for the for the fringe parties i think those indeed may come in the long run so um, you said, again, ideology, populism is part of it, nationalism is the other part of it. And that is something that these parties have been trying to capitalize on. So um, you spoke about the RN and other parties. Uh, I think initially it was all about, let's exclude foreigners, they bring in the COVID, let's close the borders. So that's something that they can capitalize on. And, and again, I also think that the um, economy is something they'll try to capitalize on. So as the pandemic unfolds and the economic crisis this is coming because it will come of some sort. I think again, these parties will try to get um, votes from from that. So the long term consequences, I agree, remain to be seen. But I think in the short term, it, it makes sense to expect that the opposition parties are likely to suffer. Okay, after two introductions, it's already becoming apparent that we need to differentiate uh, between the different parties we're talking about uh, on the basis of their approach to COVID, on the basis of their position within their respective political systems as either fringe parties uh, or government parties. Um, you're also a an, an regional expert. Uh, you've researched a lot um, on populist radical right in Greece. Um, but also on the populist radical right in the UK. Um, what can you tell us about the relationship between the populist radical right and the pandemic in these two quite different countries? Indeed, different, very different countries and very different patterns. And I think starting with the Greece, the Greek um, context is a bit complicated because, uh, as you know, the Golden Dawn was uh, recently indicted and currently in prison. And, and so that was really for non-pandemic related reasons. That was the culmination of a, of a, of a long term, uh, long standing trial uh, for murder, grievous bodily harm and, and maintaining a criminal organization, etc. And I think since the eradication of the Golden Dawn, the far right scene is 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 weakened and it's it's much different. I, I'd say the only party that, that really can be termed far right that has some, some electoral support at the moment is the Greek solution, um, which I saw very recently in a recent poll, it's, it's on 5%. So generally I would say this party, from what I know, um, it's really been targeting the government more. So criticizing the government for not dealing with the pandemic properly, um, asking actually for free tests and things like that. So I, I, I don't think maybe similarly to what Katerina was talking about, I don't I don't think that they have they, they resemble the UK in the sort of the anti lockdown measures, um, you know, that Nigel Farage has been suggesting, uh, uh, etc. But I also think that the, um, the nationalism point is important here. So again, it, it, there's been a lot of, you know, we need to do it, we do it well in Greece, that Greece did really well in the first for the first um, cycle. Um, and it's all about national pride as well. We did really well. We need to close the borders. We opened the borders and that's why we got loads of um, people from, from outside and that's why we got the second wave. And, and so that's the kind of narrative. And I think it's really different to the narrative that's going on in the UK with uh, with Nigel Farage introducing his new party now. Um, you may have seen a drawing on sort of anti lockdown um, narrative, but again, I don't know how successful that's going to be. I was looking just before we started at some recent YouGov data and it, it seems that most people who criticize 
the government's um, policies actually think the government is not going far enough with its lockdown measures. Uh, and so I think that there isn't widespread support for this kind of politics. That doesn't mean, however, that it doesn't, it's not going to be successful. It depends on what we mean by success. If we think that this party, you know, if success is, is broadening an electoral base, I think that will be difficult, especially with these attitudes at the moment. Um, but, but retaining a small um, but secure base is not, is not unlikely. So I think that's what we're talking about in the UK. Thank you, Daphne. We move on to Leonie de Jonge of the University of Groningen. Good evening, Leonie. Hi, good evening. And Do you agree with the two previous speakers that um, the current situation can be both opportunity and risk for the populist radical rights? Yes, and I think I have high hopes for Matthijs that he will make the counter argument, but I will sort of tag along with this argument. So at the onset of the pandemic, there were a lot of commentators who suggested that this pandemic would expose the incompetence of the populist radical right and that it would bring about their downfall. But the main point that I want to make is that the populist radical right is here to stay. So it is very tempting to suggest that COVID will kill the populist radical right. And as I said, at the onset of the pandemic, there was some reason to believe that this might be the case. And there were three main reasons why. First, we saw this rally around the flag effect, so that in many countries we saw short-term boosts of support behind the establishment. Um, and the second reason is that uh, we also saw a sudden thirst for expertise, what Daphne was saying, this uh, thirst for trustworthy news, news information and expertise seemed to be back on the table. And then thirdly, we also saw that the public focus shifted away from this item of uh, identity politics and thereby uh, decreasing the salience of immigration. And immigration, of course, is the single most issue for the populist radical right. And especially in the UK, this was a really big thing because in the run up to the Brexit referendum, immigration had really dominated the public agenda, but then all of a sudden immigrants became the heroes of the pandemic and the tabloids shifted from vilifying migrants to uh, praising them for their contributions. So. Initially, there was some reason to suggest that the pandemic could take the wind out of the sails for the populist radical right. And it is also true, and that has not been mentioned yet, that some populist radical right politicians and parties really seem to be struggling. So Donald Trump lost the US presidential elections. In Germany, the Alternative for Deutschland is dipping in the polls. And in the Netherlands, the Forum for Democracy exploded. And all of these three cases, uh, in all of these cases, news sources have indeed made a link and said that it's somehow linked to their failures to deal with the pandemic. So in the US case, Trump's handling of the pandemic is seen as a, one of the causes for his defeat. And also in the Netherlands and in Germany, the Forum for Democracy and the AfD were criticized for supporting anti-lockdown protests and spreading conspiracy theories. But the point I wanna make is that although this is very tempting, this argument, and I can see why many commentators are making it, I think that it's actually misleading. The story is actually much more complicated because the failure of these parties cannot solely be attributed to the pandemic. And there are two main reasons why I think that the pandemic will actually add fuel to the populist fire. And the first of this is that it has generated a lot of insecurity, including concerns over economic and also physical security. And we know that populists thrive in times of crisis. And in an insecure environment, voters, they tend to kind of move away from the moderate parties at the center and seek salvation in the simple messages of populists. Um, and more generally, I think that any type of crisis can create fertile ground for populists. And then second of all, the underlying causes that gave rise to the populist radical right are still there. So this dissatisfaction with mainstream politics, rising inequality, voter dealignment, um, also the, this critique of globalization, all of that is still there. And if anything, I think that the pandemic could accelerate some of these underlying frustrations. And then finally, I think it's also worth bearing in mind that the populist radical right party family is very heterogen heterogeneous. So it's diverse in the sense that um, there was no unified response. And we've already seen at the examples that Katerina mentioned, Italy and, and France, that there was uh, a different response than, for instance, in the Netherlands. And the point is that I think we really cannot generalize on the effects of the pandemic on the entire party family. 
really not all of them reacted in the same way. And as Daphne said, those in power, uh, there was a difference between those in power and those in opposition, but even within those in power, there was differences. So, um, for instance, some in power downplayed the seriousness of the situation. Think about Trump and Bolsonaro. But others in power took it very seriously. For instance, Orban in Hungary or Modi in India, they really saw it as an opportunity to expand their powers. And then some in opposition initially called for stricter measures. Sarah, you've already mentioned uh, the Dutch two far-right parties. And others in opposition were actually calling for looser measures. That is now the Dutch Forum for Democracy. So, and in fact, the Dutch case, I think, is a really good example to illustrate that we cannot generalize because here we have a country with two electorally successful radical right parties, uh, the, the Forum for Democracy, which is currently in free fall, and uh, Wilders' Freedom Party, which is going strong, suggesting that we are really not witnessing the end of an era. And um, yeah, I think I, I wanna end with two sort of observations that can serve as, as a starting point for further discussion. First is that, um, so my, my whole point has been that this pandemic is at the very least creating opportunities for populists to solidify their power. But while we are focusing on the right, I'm really wondering what happened to the left. So where have all the left-wing populists gone? In the wake of the 2008 crisis, we did see some left-wing populism, Podemos in Spain, Syriza in Greece, and they've sort of disappeared into the background a bit. Um, and perhaps more generally, the economic crisis that comes from all of this leaves a lot of room for the center left to reestablish themselves. So where are they in all this? And then second, and in line with this, and I will stop there, to me, it looks like we see the re-emergence of the same dividing lines at play before the pandemic. So at first we thought this pandemic is really going to be a big game changer. It will fundamentally shake, shake the dividing lines that we have in our society. But Perhaps the more interesting story is that the dividing lines are remarkably stable. And looking at the Netherlands, as of now, it looks like the upcoming elections will once again be framed as a race between Rutte versus Wilders. So just like we had in 2017, suggesting that the pandemic didn't really change fundamentally anything. So we see both continuity, but also opportunities for the populist radical right to grow even further. Um, you already alluded to uh, what has happened in the Netherlands, but you're also an expert on what usually happens uh, just south of the border. You're an expert on Belgian politics. Uh, what has the response of the main populist radical right party in Flanders, the Vlaams Belang, have been? Yes, so the Vlaams Belang is also a very interesting case because this, of course, is a party that is in permanent opposition. It's never been in government, mainly because it's um, really, uh, yeah, sort of uh, set offside by all mainstream parties by means of a cordon sanitaire. And it is actually using the pandemic to showcase that it can be a responsible governing party. So it's been very critical of the government uh, in, in really in various ways. And it's, it's really trying to use this uh, pandemic as an opportunity to show that it's ready to go into power. And it is benefiting a lot at the polls. If we're just looking at some um, uh, and of course, there are many other things at play that help to explain the success of uh, the Flams Belang at the moment, uh, but it looks like uh, it is really benefiting from the situation. Okay, let's uh, turn to our fourth expert, Matthijs Raudana of the University of Amsterdam. Good evening, Matthijs. Hey, Sarah. Hi. Hi. Um, I would like to ask you the same question. Uh, how is the pandemic affecting the populist radical right? And I think you have some numbers for us to show, uh, right? Well, some of them. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. This. Um, I will try to be as brief as possible, and I'm going to try to be uh, to argue that uh, well, COVID-19 is bad news for uh, the populist radical right. Um, and actually, what I'm going to say right now is uh, I'm going to repeat to quite some extent what uh, Leonie has already uh, argued. Um, at first, one of the reasons why we might expect that it is bad news, the pandemic for the populist radical right, is the rally round the flag phenomenon, right? That uh, because uh, when there is a severe crisis, people unite behind the, the, the leader, the political leader of the country because he or she uh, unifies the country uh, in its struggle against this external enemy. Um, and it might well be the case that populist radical right parties who are often more often in opposition than in government suffer from this uh, phenomenon. 
And I have just this graph to show you. It's the poll of polls in the Netherlands. And here you can see from, from uh, February until right now, what happened to our parties. Uh, and this line you see over here is the, uh, uh, the, the party of our prime minister, the uh, uh, conservative liberals. And you can see that from March onwards, it, uh, its pop popularity increased quite a lot. Um, and this is, I think, the rally round the flag phenomenon we see here. The party became much more popular uh, in these months, and it's still just as popular as it was a couple of months ago. The second reason, uh, also already discussed by Leonie, is that the issues of the populist radical right were not salient, at least in the beginning of the crisis. Um, populist radical right parties want to talk about uh, immigration, about European unification, about, about law and order, about uh, the evil elite, uh, maybe even about uh, climate change, but that was not possible in the first weeks and months of the crisis. It was about health, of course. Later on, also more about uh, the economy, uh, but not about the issues that these parties want to talk about. And we also know that uh, once these parties uh, do, do, not, do not succeed in uh, bringing their core issues uh, into the public debate and to emphasize their issues, uh, making their issues salient, uh, that's bad news for their popularity. Um, and finally, an argument that hasn't been made yet, um, and that's about uh, public opinion. Uh, there was a, a poll uh, done by uh, The Guardian, Cambridge and YouGov, and it found that, uh, well, I will show it to you. It uh, has shown that uh, when you compare the percentage of people uh, agreeing with uh, populist statements, uh, that when you compare 2019 with 2020, so 2019 is the gray dots over here and uh, the red dots is uh, this year, you can see that in all these countries under analysis, uh, the populist attitudes among the public uh, have decreased. So the percentage of people agreeing with populist claims uh, has decreased in one year's time. Um, and uh, this research was done in July and August of this year. Um, and it might well be the case that, uh, that it, it shows that there was an uh, uh, increasing trust in uh, politicians, science, experts, and that this is the reason why we see that populism has decreased. Um, and of course, this is also bad news for the populist radical right. Okay, having said that, uh, there are also good reasons uh, to expect that there is good news for the populist radical right. Um, and let me also very briefly present three reasons. Uh, the first one is uh, polarization over support for the measures. Um, and also, uh, by the way, uh, decrease in average support for the measures of the governments. So here you can see uh, trust in uh, how the Dutch government has handled the crisis. And you can see that in April, there was a lot of support for, uh, for how the, the government handled the crisis. And that in September, October, uh, support was much lower. Um, and this is on average. But of course, we also know that there are differences between groups. Um, here you see uh, just one uh, a picture of uh, anti-lockdown anti measures in, uh, in Italy and uh, protests in Italy. And um, what we see is that there is increasing polarization over this issue and that people who are, uh, uh, who are in favor of uh, the lockdowns vote for certain parties and people who are against uh, the lockdowns also tend to vote for certain parties in uh, certain countries, although uh, it's not that clear yet. It's not really like a very clear divide. The second reason is that uh, conspiracy theories are widespread right now. This is related to uh, COVID. Um, it's, it's also not strange because we know that when there is a crisis, uh, people feel uh, anxious. Uh, they are more likely to believe that there is this uh, conspiracy of powerful people that make decisions behind the scenes, behind the backs of ordinary citizens. Um, this is spreading. We have this whole uh, uh, QAnon thing in the US and also in other countries. Uh, uh, ideas about the deep state, Bill Gates, uh, who is uh, the, the evil genius behind the outbreak of the virus, according to some. All these conspiracy theories have a lot in common with the core message of the populist radical right, namely that there is an elite uh, that doesn't listen to ordinary citizens and opens the border uh, conspires against the people by opening the borders for uh, immigrants who then uh, uh, um, uh, form a tsunami in, 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 in all these countries. And this line of reasoning of, 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 of the populist radical right and of consp conspiracy theorists is very uh, similar. And we also know that people who are more inclined to believe in conspiracy theories 
are more likely to vote for populist radical right parties. And then finally, the crisis has uh, increased economic hardship and also uh, inequality, socioeconomic inequality. And if um, populist radical right parties manage to link their own issues of nativism and populism to this increasing economic hardship and inequality, they might well profit from the crisis. So we have, uh, and here I fully agree with uh, uh, all the others, uh, we have some uh, uh, developments in the short term uh, and they indicate bad news for the populist radical right. But in the longer term, we have some developments that indicate good news for the populist radical right. So my conclusion is that it might make sense to uh, see the virus as a volcano. Uh, when it erupts, it destroys basically everything in its direct environment. However, after uh, a couple of years, uh, maybe in this case, it's not years, but still in, in the longer term, uh, there is a very fertile breeding ground for all kinds of plants, flowers, etc. And if we look at the pandemic, it, it has hit several populist radical right parties hard in the beginning, but it might well be that in the longer term, it provides a very fertile breeding ground for the populist radical right. Thank you very much. Um, a very evocative um, metaphor, I think, you use here of the volcano. Um, just to, to ask you about your regional expertise, you've published a lot about the populist radical rights in the Netherlands. Of course, in the Netherlands, we have the unique situation that we have two populist radical right parties that are represented in parliament. Uh, one of these parties has been faring very well uh, since the start of the pandemic, the PVV of Geert Wilders. Whereas the other party, uh, Bodes uh, Forum for Democracy, has collapsed uh, electorally and organizationally. Now, setting aside all the events that took place in the last weeks uh, with respect to Forum for Democracy, do you link the decline of the forum in any way to the pandemic? Um, we. I mean, I think so, yes. I mean, I, I haven't seen, uh, it, it's very recent, right? But what we see is that uh, Thierry Baudet was pretty, um, that he was embracing uh, all kinds of conspiracy theories, that he was also, uh, uh, that he was conspiracy theories and also anti-lockdown uh, protesters. And um, there are quite some indications that uh, uh, this was not really what, quite some voters for his party wanted. I mean, it is true that on the one hand, we have the PVV and we have the FVD on the other hand, and that voters for the PVV are um, more strongly in favor of, 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 of government measures. And that on the other hand, voters for the, for the FVD uh, wanted less of those measures. However, it's not true that all voters for FVD, of course, are uh, in favor of uh, uh, complete uh, um, um, uh, complete uh, um, lifting the, the, the of completely lifting the lockdown. So I think that more the more or the less radical uh, voters of the FED that they were uh, that they didn't really like the behavior and the the, the messages that Thierry Baudet was uh, was bringing across. And I think that is one of the important reasons why support for the party decreased. Not the only one, but I think it's an important one. Well, thank you very much for enlightening us uh, on the Dutch case. Uh, I would like to invite all the experts to join us for the second part of this uh, event, namely uh, a roundtable discussion. I think what we can take from the uh, introductory statements is, first of all, that the pandemic presents short-term risks and long-term opportunities for the populist radical rights. But secondly, also that there's immense heterogeneity within the populist radical right party family as a result of uh, ideological differences, as a result of uh, strategic differences with parties be either being in government or in opposition, uh, depending also on the size of the populist radical right and whether or not they're competing with other populist radical right parties in their party systems. There are quite a number of uh, relevant factors, I think, to discuss. Um, and I would like to start with the factor that has always received most interest in the study of the populist radical right, which is the ideology of the parties. Daphne already mentioned uh, in her introductory statement, we need to think about what we're talking about here, what kinds of parties. Um, and we know from the literature on the populist radical right that these parties are united by three core ideological features. 
um, authoritarianism, nativism, and populism, as uh, the Dutch scholar Kasmada would like to say. In your stories, I heard quite a bit about um, nativism. So for example, populist radical right parties, linking the virus to migrants coming into the country, also linking it to national performance in dealing with the crisis, and also quite a bit about populism. So populist radical right parties uh, opposing the establishment, uh, criticizing uh, expert knowledge. But I didn't hear a lot about the third element, which is authoritarianism. So how does this ideological feature of the populist radical right fit into this story? Who would like to, Leonie? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a great question because I think maybe the pandemic is bringing, bringing to the fore some of the underlying tensions between at least two of these ideological components. So authoritarianism on the one hand and populism on the other. Because of course authoritarianism is this belief in a strictly ordered society. And it's also um, really, it, it really demands full subordination of every part of society to the authority of the state or the leader. And it seeks to reinforce the notion of law and order in the very strictest sense. So if you extend that, uh, that ideological feature, a strict lockdown would be, I mean, it would translate into a strict lockdown. But uh, we're seeing that, um, the populist element of this, which is the idea that society is separated into these two antagonistic groups and that politics should be an expression of the general will of the people, so more power to the people. Here, the strict lockdown that comes from the authoritarianist element uh, is actually seen as anti-democratic because it's curtailing the freedom of the people. And here they are criticizing the elites for not protecting the people. So. I would be interested to see what others think of this, but I think that it might tease out some of the tensions between some of these core elements of the ideology of the populist radical right. Uh, how do the other panelists think about that, Daphne? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, that's an interesting idea. I was just sort of processing it as you were talking. I think I have two points, one disagreement and one point, I guess. I'm not convinced, and I think those who know me would know what I've argued before, that I'm not convinced that populism is the antithesis of authoritarianism. I would probably suggest that it's actually the same thing. And, and that is because at, at, at the core of populism at the end of the day is this idea that there is one indivisible will of the people and the only way to make policies is to to give it full legitimacy right so there's no there's no uh, no other view the the will of some people becomes the will of the people and that must be um it must be turned into policy no matter what so everybody else who's not the people is is excluded right so that seems pretty authoritarian to me um, so I'm, I'm not convinced that, you know, that, that, that sort of what we see, what we call today populism is, is really, although it's very much the will of the people, I think it's only pseudo-democratic precisely for that reason, because the will of the people um, excludes everybody with, an, with another opinion. But at the same time, I think what you were saying, it, 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 it made me think about, again, how diverse this party family is and whether it is a party family at all. And I'm, I'm thinking here, um, let's go back to Kasmuda. This is this idea about how they, where they stand on, on democracy and what kind of democracy they accept, right? And it, some of these parties, I think are fully authoritarian and as in they're completely, the complete antithesis of democracy. Even the Golden Dawn, I remember, you know, it said, um, we only want democracy to run as long as we're, you know, we get voted in and then we, we'd abolish it if we, if we won because we don't believe in it. But then there are the others that I would call, you call them populist, I would call them, I don't know, more on the libertarian front, right? And I think that the, the Nigel Farage sort of draws on that idea, the anti-lockdown would, would go into that. So I think we're talking about distinctions um, between those who uh, are more on the authoritarian axis and those who, 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 who are less, but it does still, beg the question for me, when we look at Eastern Europe and we look at, you mentioned yourself, you know, some of these governing or Orban and, and we see the same in Poland, are these people populists at all? Are we talking about populist far-right parties or are we talking about authoritarian 
parties that operate within structures that can can be that are facilitate this kind of politics and i'm increasingly leaning towards the latter thanks katarina yeah thanks a lot i mean it's a great great question and once again i have to bring in uh, the differences between um, the rassemblement national the league and brothers of italy Paradoxically, between the three parties, Brothers of Italy is the only party that comes from an extreme right uh, legacy, ideological legacy, if you want. Uh, it was born from a split um, from National Alliance, and today it is actually the most vocal opponent of lockdown measures in Italy. So, this is something that is extremely puzzling. On the other hand, we have two other right parties that are pretty different one from the other because the league has um, let's say an atypical ideological legacy because it was born as an ethno-regionalist party so pretty different from um, uh, the classic uh, extreme right and the rassemblement national that instead was born more in the extreme right actually social movement uh, medium now actually the league and the national front are both undergoing uh, a process of um, mainstreamization in the sense that they really end normalization. The League wants really to um, replace the mainstream right in Italy and to take the place that is now left empty by Berlusconi's party. And the Rassemblement National knows very well that French uh, presidential elections will take place in 2022. And at the moment, there is no one in front of Macron. So both the League and uh, the Rassemblement National are basically displaying 50 shades of authoritarianism, I would say, that gets really adapted to, to the context. Marine Le Pen, in the beginning of the pandemic, she said that the lockdown is the worst thing ever. Then later, she said that the lockdown is needed when you can't do anything else. And now actually in the most recent phase, she said that the lockdown should not be imposed to small businesses, which by chance are also one of the core historical constituency of the party. And, and Salvini uh, is following exactly the same um, approach to, uh, to the lockdown measure. Where they go together is uh, instead in the same direction is when they speak about security related to, for example, terrorism. Here again, the situation between France and Italy is extremely different because France in the last months has experienced two terrorist attacks. Uh, the nature has still to be confirmed, but these were events that created uh, again uh, a huge um, discussion, especially on the question of integration of Muslim minorities in France. And this gave the possibility to Marine Le Pen to endorse classic securitarian measures, anti-terrorism measures. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, she, and she tried to campaign and to bridge the issue of the lockdown to this issue of anti-terrorist measures. So I, 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 I mean, I, I see the point that Leonie uh, wants to make, but I don't think it holds if I consider the three cases I am looking at. And therefore, I think it's a very interesting uh, difference that we see between our cases. And that tells us a lot about how inconsistent, if you want, is the radical right facing uh, this pandemic. Uh, another feature, ideological feature that uh, populist radical right parties uh, share with each other is their Euroscape. Um, we haven't brought Europe into the conversation yet, um, but does it also offer opportunities for populist radical right parties because they can re-emphasize their Euroscepticism, especially in relation to the recovery fund that is now hotly debated? Any, Matthijs? Could you unmute yourself, please? Can I briefly say uh, a little bit on the previous uh, topic as well? The authoritarianism uh, uh, question, because I think uh, previously you asked me if uh, the pandemic has something to do with uh, the, the fall of Forum for Democracy. And I think that uh, it, it, it will be interesting to connect the two questions because it might well be, if you think of authoritarianism as also something that voters have, right? You can be more or less authoritarian, meaning that you want a strong state that uh, makes sure that you are safe, that protects you. Um, 
if it's true that people uh, who, are, who are authoritarian and populist and, and, and nativist and they vote for the populist radical right, um, it might well be that if they vote for a party that then later on argues that uh, uh, we should lift the restrictions, we should, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we should not have the lockdowns, that uh, a politician who also uh, embraces then these, uh, these, these theories that we should be, uh, have a more open society and that we should not have all these strict rules. It might well be that by being um, not authoritarianist enough, Thierry Baudet has lost some voters. So that it, that 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 um, actually uh, by dropping to some extent authoritarianism from the menu, that he lost uh, his voters. That might be. That's just what I was thinking about. That that is one of the reasons why uh, uh, he was going down in the polls. And does Ali have your skepticism play into this at all? In general, I think um, um, not yet that much, but I think it will. Um, of course, because uh, your skepticism is uh, a, a great way to, uh, uh, if, if, if this is, becomes a European discussion, you can easily shift the blame towards the European elites that uh, not only uh, make sure that your own citizens cannot say what they want, that, that their voices are not heard, but also that they uh, basically uh, uh, um, uh, attack your, your, your own sovereignty, that your country cannot, uh, that the voice of your country isn't heard and that the sovereignty is uh, taken away from you. And I think that is something that, that, that we haven't emphasized, but that is, uh, I guess, something that in the near future might well be a good uh, uh, way to proceed for the populist radical right. Um, Katerina and Daphne, you both study populist radical right parties in Southern Europe. Um, is the Euroscepticism there already um, becoming more to the, fr to the fore? Shall I or? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think um, I pretty much second what uh, Matthias was saying. And I think that in the case of Italy and France, Euroscepticism will play a big role for two reasons. For the, questions of, for the question of borders and in the case of Italy for the question of the discussion on the ongoing European stability mechanism. And I'm really curious to hear what uh, Daphne would, will, uh, will uh, explain about Greece, because I think there will be uh, many similarities. So if you look at the genealogy of the pandemic in the narratives of the National Front and the League, the first frame and the first narrative they put forward, it was that the pandemic was brought by foreigners entering the country. Now, back in time in February uh, for Marine Le Pen, it was mostly Chinese people and Italians coming from Lombardy, this region in the northern part of, uh, of Italy. For Salvini, uh, this was mostly about Chinese people. So Chinese people bringing basically um, the disease to Italy. But then actually in March in France, there was this big social media campaign on Twitter and there was this hashtag that was called uh, Je ne suis pas un virus, no, so I'm not a virus, that basically accused the National Front of open xenophobic uh, discourses targeting Chinese and Italian people. And Marine Le Pen, who is uh, trying to rebuild the image of her party, immediately changed the frame of her nativism, if you want. And she started actually targeting the European Union for its uh, inability to shut the internal uh, borders and external borders. And basically Salvini did pretty much the same and Giorgio Meloni the same. They are still campaigning on this. And uh, the specificity of Italy with respect to, to, to France is that uh, Salvini also brought the European Union in the question of the pandemic by denouncing the European stability mechanism. So this is a, a discussion that is ongoing. And once again, I mean, the public stances of Salvini and Giorgia Meloni are somehow contradictory with their behavior in parliament because already the first time they were campaigning against uh, the European stability mechanism and accusing uh, the Five Star Movement Conte Prime Minister uh, to second basically um, the requests of uh, the European Union but at the same time, they were voting in favor. So there is this ambiguity. They are trying to capitalize on, um, let's say, this, um, 
bridging the question of the European stability mechanism to the question of the role of the EU in internal Italian politics. And in this respect, again, this pandemic to me looks pretty much like the Great Recession. So I really think that uh, there are many um, studies that have been done already. And I think, for example, among the many to the last one by Daphne and Tim Gladys on the interactions between nativism and uh, the economy in understanding what drives actually the narratives and support for the far right in such um, turbulent times. Because the European Union and European integration is the perfect match of both nativism with borders and the economy with the European stability mechanism. Marine Le Pen didn't talk about it because for the moment in France, my impression is that the debate is pretty Franco-centric, Franco but we'll see okay. how it will evolve. Does, does Greece fit their Southern European pattern, Daphne? Not so much. So I, I think I'm going to broaden it a little bit from Greece, if that's okay, because listening to Katerina, I think you, I think you're right, but I think that there are two sort of opposing um, two tensions, if you to, you know, two opposing uh, strands here, and and on the one side, you're right. I think there will be, um, you know, there is a a potential for drawing on Euroscepticism. On the other hand, we're forgetting the the elephant in the room here, which is Brexit. Um, and right before the pandemic sort of came in, um, we did have a lot of mellowing on the, you know, exit Europe from these parties precisely because of, of, of all the, the, the Brexit impact. So, and it, I, I, if I'm not wrong, latest or at least recent Eurobarometer data do show that sort of the idea of Europe is very popular. Um, so I think that these two, two opposing, you know, um, mechanisms will, will, will play part, at least for Greece, I can tell you that the, the rally around the flag effect that Matthijs was talking about is also very strong. So new democracy is by far leading in the polls. It's the center right and governing party at the moment and they're Europhile, you know, as well. Um, and to answer Leonie's actually question from the, the beginning where you talked about what happened to Syriza, what happened to the far left? Well, they're second and lagging far behind um, as well. So um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, how powerful this has been in the in, in the short term, but I, I agree as well that I think the long term um, developments are going to be very different from those in the short term, and I'm not sure we even have the tools to be precise about them because there's a lot that we, you know, there's a lot that we're not we, we don't know, and a lot of information we don't have. For example, a, a final thing, I think we have been talking a lot um, about the the populist right or the far right. Um, but we really haven't talked about the other parties that they're competing with at all, right? So whether they capitalize or not on these opportunities also is, 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 is contingent on how other parties will capitalize on these opportunities and will deal with these constraints as well. So very complex picture, I think, difficult to, to, to get to the long term. So we do. I, I would like to pose a question to you that has been submitted by Paul Taggart of the University of Sussex, also an expert on Euroscepticism and populism, who writes in the chat, in thinking about the populist radical right and Euroscepticism, can we differentiate between a pandemic as a health issue and as an economic issue? For the populist radical right, the health issue gives it very little purchase in the EU as it has little role in health policy. But the economic impact of the pandemic is yet to really develop, and this may be key for the populist radical rights. Is this an assessment that you agree with, Leonie? Yeah, I think that is really helpful. So thanks, Paul, for sending that in. I think that um, you're, I was thinking of the same lines in the sense that when we think about your skepticism, the critique comes from two lines of reasoning. And one is, well, what critique about Europe in general, it's like one is, all-powerful Europe, it's doing too much. And the other line of reasoning is like, where's Europe? Europe is not doing enough. And I think indeed, when it comes to the health crisis, very much has been said about where has Europe been in all this? And it's mainly, mainly because Europe doesn't have much, cannot do much on this front. Um, and then when it comes to the economic factors, yes, there, uh, I'm, fa I'm fairly sure that in the long run, at least when it comes to dealing with the crisis and in, in the, the long-term effects of it, the question will come back or that element of Euroscepticism will come back, this critique of um, uh, yeah, the, the sharing mechanism and all that. So I think that um, that's a very helpful way to think about it. Um, and I was also thinking that in the, in the short term, of course, one of the big concerns for the populist radical right is the, the sovereignty over borders. And this was solved because 
the borders were shut for a bit and that took away this issue, but it, there's no doubt that it will come back. So far, we've mainly talked about the populist radical right and its ideology, uh, its electorate and its relationship to the pandemic. But Daphne has also pointed at the difference between populist radical right parties being in government and in opposition. And we have a question about that from Stephen von Howard, also an expert on the populist radical right. Um, and he asks, I'm curious to what extent the panelists attribute any electoral movement of populist parties to the actual pandemic, rather than these parties simply being in opposition. If we look at the electoral fates of opposition parties in most European countries, we see, see exactly what the esteemed Dr. Rodan and Dr. De Jonge highlighted, namely a rally around the flag effect. Um, Matthijs, um, how, how can we separate the two? How can we know what is uh, doing the work here, whether we are observing a long-term rally around the flag effect or whether we're observing a relationship between the stances of the populist radical right and the pandemic? Yeah, this is a very difficult question. I think um, uh, what we are... Um, uh, so first of all, I think the rally of, around the flag effect will not last forever, right? Uh, so it will. It, it, it's still here. It's uh, longer here than I expected it to be here. Um, but um, in, in, in the longer term, I think it's going to uh, to go away. And I think uh, 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 our esteemed Dr. Van Howard is right to argue that it, it, it might also well be the case that this is not uh, something that 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 is, that is about the populist radical right, but it's just being about. Uh, about being in opposition and that all opposition parties have actually suffered from this uh, uh, rally around the flag idea. And I think this is a much more reasonable uh, uh, story. And I think uh, uh, that is to quite some extent the case. Um, what is interesting, and, and, and here I want to link a little bit to what Paul Taggart also has said, um, it might well be that initially the crisis was really a health crisis, right? It was not an economic crisis yet. Um, it might well be that this first part of the crisis was really about authoritarianism and populism. Authoritarianism because it was about people feeling safe or not. Uh, populism because it, it was about trust in science, academics, um, uh, politicians as well. Um, and I would ex expect that in the longer term, when it becomes less of a health issue and uh, increasingly uh, an economic issue, um, and also a European issue maybe, that Euroscepticism, but also immigration will uh, increasingly play an important role. Um, so I think that the elements of populism, the populist radical right, sorry, um, uh, when you look at them among voters, that there will be a shift in importance uh, in individual salience of all these elements of the populist radical right. And I think that it will be more less about authoritarianism and increasingly more about uh, immigration, Euroscepticism. Um, of course, it's difficult to disentangle the effects of the pandemic and populist radical right parties being in opposition because there are so few populist radical right parties, especially in Western Europe, that are currently taking up government uh, responsibility. Only two years ago, this was a completely different situation with, for example, the Progress Party in Norway, um, the FPA in Austria governing. Can we learn anything from populist radical right parties uh, having government responsibility at the, the regional level in this respect, Katarina? Do we see any patterns in Italy, for example, where the Lega was in office in a number of the regions that were severely affected by COVID? Yeah, that's a fascinating question, actually. And and again, it, I think it points to the importance uh, of local level dynamics in the study of radical right politics, something that is still uh, too overlooked um, in, my, in my understanding. And I hope that Fred Paxton, who is among us, as I see, can, can help us uh, progressing uh, in the next uh, years. So actually, I mean, the League uh, is currently not in government at the national level, but it was governing three of the most hidden um, hidden regions uh, inside Italy. Uh, the region of Venice and Lombardy and Piedmont, so the region of Turin. In the three regions, uh, the scenario unfolded in very different ways and the popularity of the um, 
president of the region was affected in different ways. So the president of the uh, Venice region uh, remained extremely popular. He adopted, let's say, um, a, a South Korean approach to handle the uh, pandemic. So basically he introduced compulsory tests for all the population in the region. And uh, basically he was relatively successful in keeping numbers pretty low. Differently, the president of Lombardy, so the region of Milan, he struggled more to uh, handle with the pandemic and he hesitated on the type of health policies that had to be taken. And this has also to do with the way in which the health system is uh, managed at the local level in Italy. And Lombardy in this respect is one of uh, the most complex, uh, if possible, because there is a completely hybrid system between public and private health services. And the league who has been championing uh, the private model of uh, health uh, assistance was uh, blamed for the inefficiency of uh, handling the pandemic. And then there, there was Piedmont uh, that basically was in between uh, the South Korean uh, Venice region and uh, the, 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 the Milan case. And here again, uh, the president of the region lost support. So in a certain way, what we see at this, uh, um, at this level is that um, local politicians who were uh, particularly uh, tough and campaigning on this type of health measures have been somehow rewarded. Uh, at least in the short run, it's really difficult to say, whereas this didn't happen elsewhere. Then in Italy, we have also another uh, populist party that is actually in government. It's not radical right, it's the Five Star Movement. And it is actually the party that is expressing the prime minister. Interestingly enough, Conte, who was particularly, uh, basically unknown <laughs> before becoming the prime minister of Italy is extremely popular. He keeps maintaining his popularity and he remains extremely popular. Uh, um, he lost uh, now, I mean, according to the last um, Ipsos survey, he has 60% of approval uh, among the Italian population. It was 70% before summer. Um, now, apparently, people are starting to blame him for, for the way in which the, the pandemic was handled over the summer. What, but what we see in the case of populist radical right parties at the local level and at the national level is that there is a difference between the appreciation for the person, so Conte or Zaya or the uh, politicians that were um, basically the president of the regions, and the party. And from what I see from the data from, from Ipsos for, for Italy, uh, you have always this difference between the popularity of the party that tends to be a bit lower than the popularity of its leader. This is the case of Salvini. And to go back um, to the discussion that uh, we had in the beginning and uh, the elephant in the room that Leoni uh, brought in our discussion, the left. I mean, if you, another trend that I find fascinating is that basically the radical left in Italy is not existent and in France is severely sanctioned by voters. So if you look at the data by Cantor Sofres that keeps basically the barometer of popularity of um, politicians and political parties, you see actually that French voters have worst opinions uh, about the Rassemblement National, the Communist Party and La France Insoumise about the way in which they, um, they spoke about the uh, pandemic, whereas the party of Macron remains pretty stable with around 50% uh, of French voters that still think that he is handling the pandemic in a pretty good way. And here again, we find the difference between the effect of the party and of the politician. The politician uh, being uh, systematically a bit more popular than uh, its party. Thank you very much for pointing out this uh, paradox that we're seeing. Um, since we're moving slowly also to the environment in which populist radical right finds themselves with uh, different parties with whom they're competing, but also sometimes allying, I would like to pose a question to you um, that was formulated by uh, Luisa Berliasiewicz from the University of Amsterdam. Um, and it picks up on a comment that Matthijs also made about uh, conspiracy theories um, in relation to COVID. Um, so what kinds of new coalitions and alliances do we see developing between populist radical right parties, extreme right parties and movements? 
um, but also more left-wing oriented ecologist anti-vax movements. So how is this pandemic sort of affecting the playing field in which populist radical right movements uh, uh, find themselves? Who would like to uh, take that question first? Katarina? I can I don't want to monopolize the time, but no, yeah. but since you're also an expert on, on the internet and the kinds of coalitions that are built there, I think you're very well suited to address this question. Okay, so first of all, I mean what 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 you can see is that um, I have in this respect three uh, simple cases because I'm talking about one party, uh, two parties, the League and the Rassemblement National, that are actively trying to be normalized. So basically, they have kept strong distances and big distances from everything that is related to far-right social movements. Um, in this respect, Giorgia Meloni, she was uh, a bit more blatant and she joined actually the uh, no masks uh, demonstrations in Italy. But let me... Um, underline the fact that we are talking about really little numbers. So these people represent less than 1% of the population. So whatever party is interested in normalizing itself, it's not there that probably will go and look for support. Um, and also, I mean, they are communicating a lot over social media. And actually, Matteo Salvini is one of the most active politicians on Twitter, not only among the radical right, but among all parties in Italy. Um, and he has developed a very uh, specific ad hoc, COVID ad hoc communication um, uh, feed, where basically he gives uh, updates about the pandemic uh, directly uh, from his Twitter account and from his Facebook account. So actually they are massively investing on social media to communicate. Marine Le Pen in this respect, she's a bit more discreet. Um, but and she's uh, still and she remains a bit less active uh, um, on on social media also because she has uh, especially on vaccine and uh, the origin of the virus she has more blurred positions than salvini was blatantly believing that uh, covid was basically uh, built uh, in a lab whereas marine le, le, marine le pen sorry she, she doesn't have uh, i mean she doesn't have uh, she doesn't endorse openly this um, theory, conspiracy theory uh, today, which is viral on, uh, on social media. So I would say that actually radical right mainstream parties that are involved in a sort of normalization process, they are very careful in taking the distances from far right social movements. At the same time, actually on social media, especially the league um, keeps fueling um, no masked campaigns, even if they know very well that this appeal to a very small part of the population. Is this a broader trend that we're seeing in Europe, that it's the, the populist radical right parties that are most interested in becoming acceptable coalition partners to the mainstream, distancing themselves most clearly from conspiracy, conspiracy groups and, and both left-wing and right-wing uh, social movements? And that's the ones that are least interested in taking up government responsibility that are moving in that direction? Daphne? Okay, from the parties that I know, I think I, I, I really agree with Katerina's point. I think it would make sense as well that anyone who wants to sort of have a, a stronger governmental position would steer away from these kinds of politics. And I think just, I'm just thinking again of the, of the Nigel Farage party here, the anti-lockdown. And, and I think that's in a way this, it's always been, he's always been for going for single issue, um, types of things, Brexit became appropriated by the mainstream, but I, I, I doubt now this one will become, as I said, I was looking again at, at, at this data, I think over 70% um, polled in, in, in a recent YouGov poll suggested that they think that the measures um, are even not restrictive enough and um, they support the lockdown and they, they basically wouldn't support this kind of party. So I, I think this this uh, reinforces Katerina's point that it, it's this is more a fringe position and it, it's likely we should expect it to be um, to be followed by those parties that want to have no interest in, in government. Leonie? 
Yeah, just to offer a counter example, and maybe Matthijs can help me with this one, but I think that if we look at the Dutch case again, you have one party that is embracing conspiracy theories and one that has been sort of distancing themselves from them. So Geert Wilders has been quite clear in a sense that he's saying, no, we should not go that, down that route uh, for obvious reasons that Matthijs mentioned in terms of the voters not being interested in that so much. But um, he's not interested, he's an opposition builders, but he's not very interested in governing. And yet he's distancing himself from these conspiracy theories. So that would offer a bit of a counter narrative. Agreed, Matthijs? Um, yeah, yeah, I think, but what I also think um, that there might be, that there, there can be so many different reasons why he, uh, why he does so. And I think, um, I think he's not really interested in trying to uh, to be a, a coalitionable partner, but I think um, I think that for him and uh, and he knows his voters very well. What I said that, that authoritarianism is more important and that it's just too um, too risky and also something that that is not in his 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 line of thought to embrace these all these theories. He is to some extent a very um, uh, his party and is, is is pretty conservative, authoritarian, I would say. Also, uh, well, in in some some issues, it's it's pretty liberal as well, or pro progressive, maybe even compared to other countries. But still, um, I think that he he does know very well that his voters are uh, very careful when it comes to COVID. Um, and many of the, his voters, and that he would he would. Uh, it would be extremely risky to, uh, to, 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 to move into that direction. And he is a very skilled and strategic politician that would never do just that if he doesn't have, wouldn't have a very, very good reason for doing it. Okay. Uh, Daphne, I think you wanted to come in as well. It's just extremely briefly uh, to, to say, but I, maybe he doesn't want to be government. I think I agree with Matthijs, but he does want to be um, a broad uh, party base, right? He doesn't want to be a strong opposition party, if I'm not mistaken. So that way, maybe it makes sense. Yeah. So we're seeing quite some diversity within the, the populist radical right uh, party family uh, for, for a whole range, range of reasons we've discovered. So is this likely to create any tensions between the parties? It's taken them years and years to come to successful cooperation, for example, in the European Parliament, where they formed more or less cohesive party groups. Is this pandemic creating new fault lines among these parties? Leonie? Um, yeah, um, just my, my initial thought of that was that the, the populist radical right, even though they have been moving closer together in the past years because they've been so successful, they've never really been a global united front to begin with. They're very strange bedfellows. Um, they are very diverse as a party family, as we've already said, and their motives to cooperate on the international level, I think, are generally quite strategic rather than ideological. So my point is that these parties are by definition very strongly nationalist. And we know that an international group of nationalists is very hard to form to begin with. And um, in the first place, these parties operate in a, um, in, in a domestic political arena. So I think that um, the responses from these parties to the pandemic are shaped by these national considerations. And if anything, it will make international cooperation more difficult. I see a lot of the panelists nodding to that uh, comment. Uh, Matthijs, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, I, I, uh, I fully agree. I think um, um, that they will, uh, um, as long, uh, there are many different reasons for, for, for these parties for having an opinion on this issue. And, uh, and, and as, as we have seen, they behave differently, differently depending on whether they're in opposition or in government or whether they emphasize uh, one of their ideological features or the other. And um, we've also seen that all these parties uh, in all these countries behave differently. Even within one country, we see that these parties are really uh, far away from each other. So as long as the issue of, uh, of, of, of COVID is high on the political agenda, I think, it, it, if anything, it will uh, hurt them and their uh, future collaborations and not really help them to, to come closer together because the differences are just 
there and they will not disappear as long as it is uh, it is salient in the public debate. So even though the pandemic might create electoral opportunities in the long, long run, it might also create strategic challenges. We're slowly coming towards the end of this session. We have about 10 minutes left. So I would like to take the opportunity to post some questions to you from the audience. Um, if you're listening to this uh, broadcast, then please uh, uh, leave your uh, questions in the Q&A uh, box or leave them on our YouTube channel. Um, first of all, I have a question from Nicolas Fuster. Are the reasons why the populist radical right emerged, such as immigration, the Euro crisis, identity sentiments, and so on, still there? In order to better identify whether COVID-19 is not good news for the populist radical right, to what extent can we argue that those reasons will be gone with the pandemic? So is, is the pandemic changing anything in the breeding ground for the populist radical right? Uh, Daphne? Thanks, I'll have a go at that. Um, I think that the conditions are still there. Uh, Matthijs, you mentioned in, in the beginning in your in your presentation, you had the decline of populism, but I know from the same study, because I was looking at it myself, it also shows that immigration has actually not decreased, right? So there is still the salience, for example, of, of immigration remains quite high, people are still concerned, but not all parties capitalized on immigration crises, on economic crises, you know, et cetera. In Southern Europe, it remains a big puzzle. How did Greece and, 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 uh, and Italy and, and, and Spain and Portugal all have a major crisis and yet only Greece at that time, only the Golden Dawn capitalized on it, right? Similarly with immigration, if we look at it at the, um, at the aggregate level, the countries with the higher levels of immigration are not the ones with the highest far right party support. Actually, on the contrary, perceptions play a very important role. So again, I think it's not so much about these conditions still being there because they are, but really what, what society is not discontent? You know, what society does not have people with anti-immigrant sentiments? What society doesn't have people that, that feel relative deprivation? The, the question for me is also very much a supply side one is to what extent are these parties able to capitalize on these opportunities to, to, to put forward a convincing narrative, convincing in themselves, but also convincing vis-a-vis -vis their competitors. So I think that in a way is a constant that will still inform politics to come. Um, but now these parties have to take in the pandemic as well and have to prove that somehow they are able to, to accommodate all those discontent from all these other issues and also from the pandemic. We also have a question from Anders Jupskas from the C-Rex Institute in Oslo. Um, as a response to the financial crisis, West European populist radical right parties made the nativist and populist aspects of their ideology an even more integral part of their increasingly distinct economic agenda. However, there was no economic authoritarian response to the crisis, probably because the undeserving poor within the nation state could hardly be blamed for rising unemployment. What kind of economic responses from populist radical right parties are we likely to see this time round? So how will populist radical right parties respond to the uh, economic consequences of the pandemic? Who would like to address that question? Leonie? I'll take a step, but I think Daphne will be more better suited to answer this. But I think um, just thinking about the Flemish case. So this is a very interesting one where the Flemish interest party, the Flemish Belong, has over the past years positioned itself economically more left wing. And I use quotation marks because it's not actually left wing, it's not very actually inclusive, but it's more uh, welfare chauvinistic in a sense that welfare, yes, strong welfare state, yes, but only for the natives. And we see that they are now already positioning themselves further along that line. So basically saying um, that what will follow is probably the economic crisis and that uh, there needs to be a strong welfare state, but only for the natives of Flanders. So you can see that they, their nativist element is uh, aligning quite neatly with their economic argument. Is that something that the other panelists will agree with? Daphne? Yeah, just quickly, I think I think you're absolutely right. And um, we can observe that across the board, actually. We, we did... Um, 
some some research using comparative manifesto project data as well on how these parties have been um, dealing with this welfare chauvinism in, in their agenda. And I think that quite a lot of them, you can see a line increasing. So since the economic crisis, um, so the Rassemblement National is one of them, the FPO as well with some changes, but they've been increasing becoming um, more uh, welfare chauvinism, placing a greater emphasis on, on the economy. So I would say that's, that will continue as a trend. Related to this question, we have a question from Brett Meyer, who asks, how do you think that working from home and other technology related economic changes that COVID has sped up will affect uh, the populist radical right? Uh, Matthijs, you've done some research into the relationship between economic background characteristics of uh, uh, populist supporters. Um, how do you think that these changes will affect their electorates? Yeah, um, working from home, that's really uh, difficult. I think um, what, I th what I think what will be very important is that, um, well, two things that I've also uh, briefly touched upon in my uh, presentation is, and I think the, the first one is um, that um, um, this increases uh, um, economic, uh, well, hardship. Right on uh, at, at the individual level, people are people are going uh, uh, to experience hardship because of the crisis. Um, I think that one, as long as the crisis is in place, as long as we have the, the the coronavirus crisis, this will not necessarily lead to voting for the populist radical right because this is not really the moment for uh, experimentation for people. Uh, this is not the moment to vote for a radical party. But as we have seen, many mainstream parties have profited because. People do not want to vote for something very radical when there is a huge crisis going on. They want to go for something that is safe. However, uh, when the crisis itself goes away, but the economic crisis endures, I think it's very well possible that the, the populist radical right will profit when, when, when the, the, the circumstances in general, uh, in, uh, when, when it comes to health, will be uh, safer, but the economic situation for many people will be problematic. I think that will lead to, uh, that might well lead to more populist radical right voting. Anyone else who would like to come on, in on this topic? Uh, Leonie? Well, I was gonna throw the ball to Katarina because I think it obviously uh, opens a, um, a technology question in terms of social media and the far right is obviously not so much mobilizing on the street. I mean, they also do that, but they are much more active online. We're also very active online. So when it comes to technology, well, maybe Katerina can say something about the online developments of this. Katerina, um, do you expect that this will have an effect on the success of the populist radical rights? I mean, I don't know what will happen in the future, but there is a very nice study that was done by Nonna Meyer and Yarovny that is called The Losers of Automation, and where they show basically that uh, they compare 11 European countries, they use European social survey data, and they show that people who feel more threatened by automation processes in their work condition and in their profession are more likely to support the radical right. So um, then of course, automation is not like using social media, but as actually the pandemic is redefining the way we work and uh, the divisions between, you know, like uh, workspace and private space and uh, everything that surrounds right work, like also uh, the building of social capital and the structure of social capital. I think that, uh, I mean, if we stick to existing findings in research, we could say that this is the case. Then I think it will depend a lot also on how radical right parties themselves will frame this issue, whether they will be able to present automation as a challenge for people and for what type of people, because also there are, um, I think about France and Italy, and Italy huge uh, digital divides inside the country. So probably, again, we will see a more regionalized effect rather than uh, a national one. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to come back to the start of this meeting to round up. Um, so many of the experts or the commentators, I would say, that predicted the end of an era for the populist radical right did so on the basis of a reappraisal of expertise and knowledge within political processes. 
Um, and there's a question about this by Luca Manucci, who asks, do you expect any long-term effect of the pandemic on the political role of experts? In particular, do you think they will become more important? Do you think the links between technical and political decisions will become more explicit with the implementation of sorts of technocratic experiments with governments that include experts? And of course, then the follow-up question of me, how will this then affect uh, populist radical right parties? If this technocratization does take place, will this uh, enhance their electoral chances? Um, who would like to respond to that? Katarina? I think that actually radical right parties are trying to go technocratic themselves. And here again, I think that um, for the Rassemblement National, it's a matter of uh, seeking legitimacy. And it is not by chance that uh, in the last month, Marine Le Pen has echoed the campaigns by this uh, maverick scientist that pop up in French politics, whose name is Didier Raoult. So Didier Raoult is a virologist based in Marseille, who became known in France because he proposed a treatment uh, for COVID that actually was originally a malaria treatment. and. Uh, he published his findings that were not peer reviewed. But actually, this maverick scientist uh, presented himself as an expert in the field, but at the same time, as an expert in the field who was contradicting the doxa of the establishment scientific community. So he directly targeted in, 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 in his campaigns the Lancet, the medical journal, and actually, Marine Le Pen didn't endorse openly his campaigns, but at the same time, she was one of the first one in the French parliament who proposed actually um, an open committee for uh, Didier Raoult in front of the prime minister to, to give voice to his tendency. So I think that on the one hand, as Luca was saying, we will see an increasing importance of experts in the years to come, probably also because we are dealing with issues that are extremely complicated, health issues and specialized, and the economy again. But at the same time, I think that this time radical right populist parties won't be just passive. They will try to build, they will try to go technocratic. And, and in this respect, the Rassemblement National I think is already looking for its expert, and and if and it found it in Didier Raoult, who is also a very popular figure among the Yellow Vest in France. So we'll see how it will it will evolve. But yeah. is this a trend you recognize in the countries you study? The emergence of populist radical right experts, Leonie. Yeah, this is the techno-populist argument that is coming around, where we used to think of technocracy and populism as opposites, but increasingly we're seeing that actually they're more like, uh, I think Chris Bickerton calls them like Siamese twins or something, that they're always connected, they always come together. And there's a book coming out on this soon, so we will know more about this techno-populist phenomenon. I think that it, that is a good way to round up, to encourage our listeners and viewers to read more on the topic. Uh, what I take away from this panel is that the pandemic has created short-term challenges, but long-term opportunities for populist radical right parties. That it's really up to the populist radical right parties themselves to see these seize these opportunities. And that a lot will depend on their leadership, their organization, uh, and their uh, campaigning. Um, but also that we should remember that Europe is incredibly diverse, uh, diverse in its polities, but also diverse in its populist radical right parties and their response to the pandemic. So I would propose that we reconvene this panel in a year from now to see what the long-term uh, effects have actually been. I would like to thank you very much for joining us tonight for our panel. Thank you to Katarina Froyo, Daphne Hadikliopiu, Leonie de Jonge and Matthijs Rodai. Thank you at home for uh, listening or viewing uh, this event tonight. We'll be back with the European Politics and Transition Series after the Christmas break, and we'll be discussing then social policies in Europe. Thank you very much for listening and tuning in and see you at our next event. Thank you.